Well, the wife's azaleas are finally popping out and her snowball bush is doing real good. I guess that's what it's called. And then that other one way over there, I have no idea what it is. They always look neat in the morning when I come out. Just before the sun comes out, they just seem to have a better looking color to them. I don't know. Well, hello again. Yeah, I've taken a couple of days off and did nothing really. Just kind of relaxed. I did go to a karate tournament down Little Rock. Uh, I did not film it again because I wanted to just enjoy it. Fortunately, our grandson John, he took first place in sparring. That's the first time I've seen him do that in a long time. I'll tell you what, he had some really tough matches, boy. And also, for those of you who have been following his, uh, you know, growing up cycle from beginning to end, he, uh, I told you in a previous video, he was doing mixed martial arts training. Been doing it for, I don't know, 18 months now, I guess. His instructor, I hate to say this, but his instructor has got him a kickboxing match, a professional kickboxing, well, probably amateur. He scheduled him. He got a fight for him out in Oklahoma, Dewey, Oklahoma. So I think it's on the 15th of May. Uh, he'll be going out to, I think it's the 15th. It might be a couple days later. I can't remember, but he'll be going out to Dewey, Oklahoma to fight in a match with some guy he doesn't even know yet. In kickboxing his parents are going to take him out you know and it's not going to be I'm not sure how his mom's going to take that when you know the other guy hauls off and whacks John maybe a lucky one or, or maybe a good one you know you never know how good the opponent's going to be but anyway he's he's really looking forward to it he's all pumped up you know <laughs> my his dad and I spoke about it the other day we talked about it and he said you know uh, and maybe this is what he needs. If he gets out there and he gets his butt whipped, maybe he'll say, hey, this really isn't for me. <laughs> Just concentrate on college beginning in the fall. Or, he said, the worst thing that could happen is if he goes out there and he beats the crap out of the guy, it's going to make him think he's invincible. So, you know, either way, uh, John's going to be, uh, you know, thinking it over one way or the other. I'm not sure. But he will go to college. He will graduate. Simple as that. I don't care what he does after that. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to the old Thunderbird here. Uh, last time, uh, oh, before we start on this, I mean, we got a lot of comments last time about that stupid fuel pump and how I should uh, kick over the engine a little bit, which would take that concentric lobe, you know, and move it out of the way a little bit where the arm of the fuel was fuel pump would fit in a little better. I knew that. I, knew, I, I was just too lazy to do it. Okay. <laughs> I was too lazy. I didn't want to do it. And I decided, to, uh, let's just go with an electric fuel pump instead. And uh, I got a hold of Brandon. I said, you know, you have a lot of experience with electric fuel pumps. I have never used one before. I said, which one would be the best kind to buy? You know, as far as, uh, you know, reliability goes, you know, do you have any experience in that area? He came back and said, you know, forget the electric fuel pump. You need to still stick with that mechanical. So, <laughs> of course, he's not the one laying under the stupid car on the concrete either. But I appreciate everybody's con uh, comments on that. I, I should have I should have never mentioned the fact that the pump didn't go in. And, and you know, you, a lot of you said the same thing. Just pump the engine over. I know that. I can do it with the ratchet down here on the, on the harmonic balancer, the flywheel gear, whatever. Or I can... Uh, not the flywheel, but the uh, the crank uh, bolt, or I can, you know, use a battery. I could have used some jumper cables over there just from where the battery's sitting. Actually, I could have probably jumped it over to the cables and, you know, bang, bang a little bit, move it around. We'll see. We'll work on that later, okay? I'm still not convinced that's what I want to do, but right now it looks like that's the, that's the way we're going to go. Okay, uh, first thing we're going to do, last time I told you we had a broken shock. Actually, it's not broken. What happened was, yeah, it's loose. And it's now it's no longer functional okay what happened was the shock pulled out here's where the top of the shock mounts up right down underneath this this black thing and it's got a couple of rubber bushings with a nut it pulled right on down through is what happened so it's not broken it's just no longer attached to the top but it doesn't matter we're going to get rid of it we're going to put new shocks in so the way we remove this shock is thing. first thing you have to do is there's supposed to be three bolts holding this thing on. One, uh, two, and then there's supposed to be a third one over here. And as you can see, it's missing, which is always nice. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'll take the rest of them off. I've already loosened a couple of them up, the last two with this uh, socket. We'll go ahead and get that off of there. And then 
down here at the bottom. Let me get over here and show you guys. There's some of you are working on front ends on your Thunderbirds, and you appreciate me showing you this stuff. Let me get all the bumps and bangs and all that other crap. But the uh, up in the bottom of the lower control arm here, okay, there's three bolts in there. See those bolts? Those are the bolts that hold a plate. Actually, the nuts. You get the you get the nut off, and the bottom of the shock is loose down in the center of the spring, and the way the shock is removed is up through the top. And it's also the way it's put in. So let's go ahead and loosen up those three bolts on the bottom, get that black thing off the top, and then we'll come back. All right, let's see what she looks like underneath. Ooh, another mud wasp nest. Fancy that, huh? <laughs> Jeez, unbelievable. Let's see if this is loose. Yes, it is. Something's holding it on here. This hose, I guess. Let's go ahead and get this baby off. Ah, okay, that comes off. Yeah, see where the rubber got tore all the pieces? Where the bolt pulled through, or the top of the shock pulled through? It went in this way, and it just yanked it right on down. Came loose. I don't know. I don't know what would have caused that. Maybe they didn't put a washer in or something. I don't know. We'll see in a minute. Let me set this crap down here where we know where it's at. And of course we will put our bolts back on where they were so we know where they're at. I'm gonna, this one here is missing the bolt completely. Isn't that strange, huh? You feel down in there. It's not even there. They must have broke it off. I bet when they put that thing on there they broke it off. Jeez. Hmm, not sure what I'm going to do about that. I'll worry about it later because we will be taking these coil springs out of here. I will be putting new coil springs in. The price of both coil springs, new coil springs, is going to be less than half the cost of a single uh, leaf spring that I bought. So, you know, for like, I think I can get these things for 100 bucks. So, why would I not want to replace the leaf springs? These things have been in there since 1966. Time to get rid of the leaf spring, I mean the uh, coil springs, I'm sorry. Time to get rid of the coil springs and uh, toss, I'll, I'll probably give them to that guy that I gave the leaf springs to. He makes knives out of that good old steel, so I don't know. If he doesn't want them, fine, I'll just chunk them. All right, that's done. Now let's go down and take the bolts out of the bottom of the shock and get that plate loose. All right, uh, these are the three bolts I have to take off, but you know, this looks to me like they've replaced these lines when they did the front brake job on this car a while back. And I tell you what, I don't know who did this job, but they just, they are so bad, they were so bad. It's, watch this metal brake line now. Let's, let me get this hose out of your way. Watch the metal brake line now that that uh, flexible line's attached to. Look at that. You can't do that. That is not right. You know, there is a clamp missing somewhere. That thing is just bouncing around down there. And guess what? It's rubbing against something. I think it's rubbing against this clamp down here. There's a clamp down there. I don't know if you can see it or not. But eventually that line would wear right through by rubbing onto that clamp. You can't have this kind of stuff, people. This is really bad. This is really shoddy work. It's crappy work. Don't ever do stuff like that. Do it right or you'll pay the price later on. Now a job like this, you know, is kind of hard for a ratchet. You can get to these two on the outside here probably pretty good. But the one all the way in the rear is a little bit tough to get to. The ratchet won't fit. Now I have jacked up this thing right here with the jack. But I don't want to take it up too far. You know, I just kind of lifted the whole thing up. And... This is John and the tool, the tool man here. I'll tell you. you can take a standard old uh, box end wrench. You can get to them a lot easier. But boy, I'll tell you, it take you forever doing a little bit at a time. You know, doing a little bit here, and then you know, you'd be here forever trying to get that done. And I've already sprayed these things with uh, liquid wrench a couple of days ago to help loosen them up. Instead of using the ratchet on this, instead of using this box end open end wrench that I have right here. Do is I'm going to use one of my ratchet wrenches. Now your ratchet wrench looks just like a socket on one end. It's got a box end on the other. I guess you can get them with a box end on each end. I don't know. But uh, let me see if I got it right. What you can do is this thing acts like a ratchet. See it? Just like a ratchet. Cool, huh? 
that I don't have to sit here and do a little bit at a time. These things really come in handy sometimes. I'm glad I bought them years ago. All right, let me finish getting them out. Get a set of these. You never know when you're going to need them. Now, as usual, I have one bolt that wants to give me trouble. The more I try to unloose it, the more I try to loosen it, I, I always get criticized for saying unloosen. <laughs> Something I had from a kid, I think. Well, the more I try to loosen it, uh, the tighter it's getting. And uh, there's probably a lot of gook in the threads that don't want to get out of the way. Now, most of your dumb mechanics, when they just keep on going and wind up breaking the bolt, that's how a lot of that stuff happens. Don't do that. That you know, the way you do it is now. If you live up north and there's a lot of rust and crap and everything, and you're on your cars and your bolts are practically rusted through, chances are you're going to break it off anyway. But down here where I live in the south, you don't see any rust here. That's all dirt. There's no rust in here at all. Okay, it's all just mud wash dirt and crap like that. And uh, this is all this stuff is just dirt. Anyway, what you do in a case like that is you screw the nut back up. Just go back the other way. Screw the nut back up where it came from. And then clean those bottom threads with a small wire brush. Squirt, squirt a little oil on it. And then give it another try. Just keep working at it. Don't just keep turning it off and off and off until the stupid bolt breaks. The bolt will break, okay? You gotta be a little bit smart about this stuff. Good mechanics are very intelligent. Lousy mechanics are just that, dumb. This is why it's important uh, to also have a set of steel and brass brushes. You know, brass for the stuff you don't want to scratch. And these little steel brushes, you know, they're the size of toothbrushes. You know, they're a dime a dozen. You get them on eBay or down at Walmart or wherever you want, Lowe's, uh, Home Depot. So now that I've got it screwed, the nut screwed back toward the, uh, the bottom of the lower control arm, we'll go ahead and give this thing a good brush as best I can. Try to get all that dirt out of those threads best we can. You know, take our time. We have no rush. We're not going anywhere. At least I'm not. Just give it a good scrub. And then when I'm done, I'm going to spray it with WD-40. And don't be afraid to spray it with the WD-40 because this control arm is going to have to come out anyway. So no big deal. So let's see what happens. It looks pretty clean right now. All right, now let's see what happens. See if that'll come out. I can find my wrench. Here we go. You watch. I get always get a 50/50 chance of getting it on right. I'll probably get it on wrong. Nope, that's not the wrench I want. I want this one. This one. This one. Yep, I got it on wrong. <laughs> Never fails. I swear. Come on. There we go. Let's see if she comes out now. She was really giving me a lot of problems initially. Oh yeah, she's coming right on off now, no problem at all. You see, take your time. If that bolt had broken, there would have been more problems, taking more time than it did to go ahead and clean the threads, you know, and oil them up. And sometimes you have to do it two or three times. You run it back up, run it back down. Don't expect it to be always good on the first shot. That's what separates the, the men from the boys in the mechanic world. All right, let's take a look down through the center. The plate's all loose. Well, there's the shock sitting right there at the top. Let me see here. Yep, that's the shock you're looking at right there. Let me go ahead and uh, see if I can reach down in here and get a hold of it. Yep, I can. Well, it's pretty heavy shock. Looks like it's going to take, well, no, maybe not. I might be able to get it with one hand. Oh, there we go. Of course, now she wants to get stubborn. Let me go ahead and uh, wiggle it around a little bit, see if I can get it out of that hole. But there's what the top of the shock looks like. Man, look at that. That bolt's been busted and bent right over. Holy mackerel. I wonder what they hit with that. I'll tell you what, you know, I think Ford really messed up on this car when they you know, designed the, the installation of shocks. <laughs> I had to take the whole thing down from the bottom of the car, remember, to get the back shock out. It took forever to get those two out. Now this thing here, once you got it up, you have to spin it around so the point 
see the point the way it's set up it has to go in this way see it's the only way it'll come out if I spin it around the other way it, it won't come out it's got to come up so that point is out there facing the engine then she comes right out just like a little Chinese puzzle box okay now what we need to do is uh, well what I'm gonna do really is just set this thing aside and soak it a little bit more in uh, a liquid wrench for a day or two and then I'll come out and see if I can't get that bolt out of there isn't that amazing you have to put the new shock in there in the bracket and then this thing has to go all the way down and then you got to get it in the right you know position in order to run the bolts through the hole and then put the nuts on <laughs> oh, geez. speaking of nuts I better get them put on there so I don't lose them well look who just showed up wifey she has come out and decided to watch me work on the Thunderbird that's the first time ever huh yeah yep she used to watch me work on cars all the time didn't you she was my parts runner every time I needed a part she'd jump in the car and go downtown Sometimes bring back the wrong part, have to make a second trip, huh? <laughs> well, welcome aboard there, lady. Our next chore will be removing the caliper. All I, need I think there's one bolt here on the rear, and there's another one at the bottom on the rear. Big, giant size bolts. This is a double piston caliper, by the way. And uh, But before I do that, that hose back there, you see with those little rubber things on the outside there, it'll have to be removed from the brake line. And uh, once we get the bolts out, hopefully this entire thing will swing away. But what I might try to do first is get these rusty old lines loose. Uh, while it's on the car, it gives me something to hold it, you know. I don't care, I'm going to be replacing those lines. So all I have to do, really, is get that nut loose right there. That one right there. And then it goes down to the second one on the bottom. We don't have to take them off, just loosen them up. So when we get the caliper off, it'll be easier to remove. The first bolt is located right across the top from the top of the uh, caliper and it's a uh, 15 sixteenths. There's one, see it right there? And there's another one just like it down at the bottom in the same place on the, on the rear. And as far as I can tell, those are the only two that need to come loose and uh, be removed in order to remove the caliper. So as soon as I get them busted loose and everything's working good, I'll go ahead and take loose our flexible line, that rubber hose. I decided to just go ahead and uh, take off this line while it was on the car and make life a whole lot easier. The first one, like I said, goes up here and screws into that. And the other one's right down here in the bottom. Right, Real easy to get to. Now when you do these things, when you take this, uh, these things off or put new ones in, be sure to use this kind of wrench that wraps almost all the way around. There's a name for it. I don't know what it is, but it's not your standard. Uh, you don't want to use a wrench on these kinds of uh, uh, fittings. You don't want to use a wrench like this. It, what happens is it slips and it rounds off the edges on there, and then you have to go to a pair of vice grips. Now, of course, if you're taking out an old one, and you know you're going to be replacing it, and all you have is this, yeah, you might be able to go ahead and try to get it loose, and if it rounds off, so what? You just put a pair of vice grips on it, and it'll come out. But it, you know, after you soak it a little bit, you have to soak it a little bit. It'll come out, but then who cares if it gets rounded off and messed up? I mean, you're going to replace it anyway. But if you're not going to replace it, this is the way to go. And when you put a brand new line on, this is the way to go. This is, this is a 3 8 wrench, and that's what these are, 3 8 And by the way, when you start taking this loose, you will have fluid come out, so have a pan underneath. Now that flexible hose that goes to the caliper has to be taken loose, not from the caliper itself right now. It'll come out later. But right now it needs to come off where it fits the uh, brake line, the metal brake line. That wiggly metal brake line. And the way it's done, let me get this light back up here where we can see something. There we go. The way that's done is you take a larger wrench and it fits on that, the flat side. See the two flat sides right there? You go ahead and slide that over. That is a uh, 9 16 And then you hold it still with one hand while you take the uh, 3 8 wrench. I wish I could remember the name of those things, I just can't. And then you go ahead and loosen that thing up, utilizing this right here, okay? Let me just keep it from being blurry here. There we go. You take the other wrench and put across there. Hold this one and unscrew it with this one. Once you get it separated, you're done. All right, our little rubber hose is loose. We got that baby all disconnected from that main hard line. And I'm going to go ahead and take out the two bolts on the caliper 
and I'm going to go ahead and remove it. And then the wifey and I are going to go ahead and have breakfast, and I'll see you when we get back, and we'll go ahead and remove the rotor. Meanwhile, while we're doing all that, you all take a look at our budget and where we're sitting with that. Well, as expected, and you saw, we're about $100 over budget. Actually, 95 is pretty close, but I'll just round it off on my own self here again and say 100 bucks. We're 100 bucks over the original budget of $2,500. Okay, fine, I can live with that. You know, at the whole, a lot of the money, I'm really having problems down here squatting down. I have got to get one of those roll around mechanic seats. I don't know why I haven't bought one by now. Anyway, a lot of our budget was spent on tools, uh, the jack, an air compressor, a bunch of other stuff. You know, I always consider that part of the car. I mean, part of the part of the uh, the car work because if I didn't have the car, I wouldn't have bought it. So, uh, you know, Brendan says, yeah, it doesn't. You don't really need to count tools and everything. Well, it doesn't matter either way, I guess. Anyway, what we're going to do is remove. And by the way, here's the caliper. The caliper came off. This thing is a two-piece caliper. That was surprising. I didn't know that. This is the front half. It goes like this. Then, of course, you have your rotor in between your brake, your brake pads. Down in here, it comes up from the bottom. And then uh, the bolts that we're holding it on are these suckers. Look at the size of those, baby. You need those kinds of bolts. And you can bet they're hardened steel. You don't want some flimsy bolt holding your brakes on. Forget that. The actual plungers, as you can see, are right there, right there in the back. And when you step on the brake, the fluid, of course, goes in these lines, and it pushes the uh, plunger this way, this way. And it forces that back uh, brake pad against the back of the uh, rotor. And then the other one is pulled this way and forces the brake pad against the front of the rotor. So that's what we've got, and uh, you've got a line that goes in the front and the back, and uh, I think the line that goes in the, in this one here is right, yeah, right there. Okay, see, there's where, there's where the other line goes in, right there. So you got a line in the back and a line in the front that operate these things in and out on both sides of that uh, rotor, okay? Anyway, just, you know, some of y'all out there who've just tuned in on this uh, series are probably wondering, why is he going through all this detail? Well, because that's the way this, uh, that's the way this uh, series is set up. This series is set up not for those who know this stuff. This series is set up for people who have never seen this stuff. So the only way I can do it is to do it in, you know, detail. I want them to see this. Whether they ever use it or not, I don't know. We do have some people who have bought Thunderbirds and... They're interested in how all this stuff comes apart and goes together because they're getting ready to work on theirs. So that's why, okay? If you already, like I keep saying in every video, if you know all this stuff, you're in the wrong video. Find some other video to watch, okay? All right, uh, now what we're going to do is take off, we're going to take off the rotor, and it's just like a normal uh, front brake drum on a normal car that has drum brakes. We're going to take off the cap. There'll be a cotter pin under there, probably a keeper, and then the nut, and then the whole thing, the bearing will be behind it. And the entire thing will come off. At least, that's what I think. So, I'll get this cap off. You take a little screwdriver, a flat tip, and get it in there and kind of tap around, tap around until it, you know, at an angle. You know, tap on the end of the screwdriver without damaging this. You don't want damages. I've seen so many of these things caved in by some moron mechanic, again, when he put them back on. He thought he was supposed to put them on with a large hammer and they would cave in the entire center. Well, I'll tell you what, that, that used to irritate me. I found so many cars over the years with that same problem. All right, let's see what I can do about this. Now, look, when you start to take this cap off, this little, this is a ridge right here. There's a ridge. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a ridge right there. And it'll be tied up against this right here. 
All you gotta do is take a little thin screwdriver like this and put it straight down like that. Tap it down with a hammer. Just barely, this is a little tiny screwdriver, that's all. I've even sharpened it up on the end quite a while back. I use this for all kinds of things like this. Just tap it straight down and you'll create a slight space between this ridge and this here. Then you just kind of lean it over this way toward a little bit of angle staying on that on the back of that ridge. Just tap the top of it with a screw, do it with a, a, a hammer, just a very light tap, 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 and it'll come apart a little bit more. Then you come over here and you do the same thing here. And if you do it two or three places, even around the top, and then you can take your screwdriver actually and put it in there like that and just kind of well, see how she's, look at there, she popped right off, see? Is that a piece of cake or is that a piece of cake? There's nothing to that. Now when you put it back on, Take your little screwdriver, maybe something a little more blunt. Like I said, I sharpened this one up a while back. You might want something a little more blunt. And put the screwdriver against that ridge all the way around. Just gently tap, gently tap, gently tap, and it'll finally go right on in and seat against your hub. You don't need to take a hammer and start slamming on this thing like that. That, that don't, don't do that. Don't even use a piece of wood and hit it with a hammer. Don't do that. Use your screwdriver, something blunt, and it'll tap all the way around and uh, it'll seat nice and tight. You heard it here. You know, sometimes my own stupidity astonishes me. I've been getting up and down off this hard floor now, I don't know, ever since we started working on the back and putting in, uh, you know, the back leaf springs and shocks and all that. Always complaining that I didn't have one of those roll around chairs, mechanics chairs with little padded tops on them, you know. And, I, and they're not that expensive. I think I can get one at Harbor Freight for like 15 bucks or less or something. Dummy me. Anyway, all of a sudden it dawned on me. I said, you know, <laughs> when Wifey was out here sitting in the chair earlier, she went off. I took her in the house. We had breakfast, and I came back out. And, and I got a look at it. I just turned my head a few seconds ago. And I said, my God, there's the chairs. Why haven't I been using the chair out of my electronics shop? This is the dumbest thing. All I had to do was roll it around. Look at it. I lowered it all the way down. It's perfect. Look at here. Man, like, oh, man, that is so much better. And I can get right down here and work on this stuff and film. Well, you know, what they say, as you get older, you get plenty of brain farts. Of course, it's only taken me, what, 43 videos to figure this out. <laughs> God, unbelievable. All right, where were we? God, unbelievable. I just, I'm, I'm stunned by that. Oh, well, it's the way it goes, I guess. <laughs> Comes from all that uh, kickboxing I used to do. They kick me in the head a lot. <laughs> anyway, here's the cotter pin I was telling you about. Everybody everybody knows how to take... Anybody who's worked on a car knows how to take a hub off, okay? Same, same, same. And, uh, you know, you can use these to do it with. I, I always just kind of gently kind of pry it away, the, the cotter pin a little bit like that. And then the one on the bottom. Depends on how it was put in by the last guy. And uh, once I get it away, I like to take a pair of needle nose after that and straighten it out with a nice big thick pair of needle nose. I don't have to worry too much. But do we use this cotter pin over? No, we do not. We do not use, unless that's, you know, if you're out in the weeds and that's all you got and you got to get to work the next day and you're running out of time and you got to go to bed and get some rest so you can go to work and, yeah, you use it until you can get another cotter pin and put in there. Just don't forget, okay? These cotter pins, once they're bent, they're not safe anymore. And uh, would, it, would it probably last 100 years? Probably so. Would it probably last a day and a half? Yeah, probably so too. So, you know, flatten it out and then just go ahead and pull it out. Then we'll take this keeper off. It just slides over the top of the nut, the big nut. We'll take that nut off and then we'll take this uh, large washer out. And then we'll pull that, we'll pull this whole hub forward just enough to get that bearing out. And then we'll just lift it off the rest of the way. So let me take the let me take the uh, cotter pin out first. Uh, the cotter pin is out. Also, put all your stuff you take off the wheel. Put them in these caps. Don't lose them. Trust me, I, I know that from experience. <laughs> now comes the keeper that keeps the nut from turning. When you put the cotter pin in, it goes through these uh, little teeth on the top of the keeper and keeps the keeper from turning, which holds the nut in place. Now the nut takes a 1 and 1 16th inch uh, wrench. Now it wasn't too tight. See, that's about what you want. Just a, just a slight tap of the hand as she came loose. You don't want these things gorilla down. I, matter of fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, 
Uh, I think they even specify a, a torque value for that thing in the, in the shop manual. I'll have to double check. But we'll go ahead and get that baby off of there. All right, now that we got the nut off, we'll go ahead and let the jack down that's underneath it, which has it jacked up. I've got everything in the cup. Everything's in the cup, the keeper, the, everything, the nut that came off. What I'm going to do is once I get the jack down, chances are this thing will just, I'll be able to grab it and just kind of pull it just a little bit. Maybe enough where I can get a hold of that bearing. If not, I'll have to put a hand on both sides, rock it out a little bit. When the bearing comes out pretty far, just shove the whole thing back and the bearing will stay there and then I can just remove the bearing. So let's go ahead and lower it down and see what happens. Now if the whole car goes crunch on the concrete, well then the whole car goes crunch on the concrete. We do not worry about such things as long as I'm not underneath it. Oh, that's not bad. Okay. See, we're still sitting on our little jack stands. Let me get this out of the way. All right, look at there. The bearing done popped out for us already. As anticipated. Oh, I got lucky on that one. All right, let's take out this washer first. We have a washer. Flat washer. Goes in there. Now the bearing. Will the bearing come out? Bearing's going to be stubborn. I'm going to have to hang on a second. Let me see if I can push this uh, rotor back in a little bit to loosen it up. A little more where she'll come out for me. One hand on the rotor and one hand on the bearing. There we go. And that's it. Okay. Now we'll set that in there also. Now, all now, this is your bearing race. This thing down in here where your bearing uh, goes against. Nice and smooth. I don't feel any pitting. Nothing. Feels real good. Okay, see how loose it is now? This whole thing will come right off. Let me take the grease off my hands and then I'll go ahead and pull it off. And that'll pretty much wrap up this video. I'll tell you why in a second. All right, she's off and this is the back of the rotor. The part that was against there. And I'm not sure what that is. It looks like some kind of possible emergency brake backup system maybe that they put on the front of rotors. What do you think? No, I don't think so. Just looks like more mud wash mess to me. <laughs> it's just incredible. This is amazing. Look at that. Ooh, this guy lived by a pond, as I, I think I've mentioned it several times. And boy, I'll tell you what, with all the mud around that pond, those old mud wash had a grand old time reproducing. All right, that's out. We'll go ahead and clean all this up. All this is going to be clean. There's an awful lot of dirt and crap here. But we'll get it all clean. We may even have to change seals. I don't know. These, these seals. Depends on what I have when I get done. I'll, I'll, if I have to, I'll just buy new seals. Just like we had on the back wheels. We put those seals in the axle housing. We basically have the same thing here. And it's just a little short axle housing is what we got here. With the bearings, you know. Anyway, uh, this is what we have now. We've got everything off. And that's that's the, uh, this is the rear uh, piston assembly. And uh, most, now most of your calipers only have two pistons. Or one piston, I'm sorry. It's in the back. And they're on a long or the front part of the of the uh, or the front uh, brake pads are, are just stationary. They just sit there, and when the uh, rear of the caliper actuates, it pulls the entire the entire uh, uh, caliper in that direction. And, wh and when it does, it causes the uh, the two brake pads to squeeze against uh, the rotor. Uh, the back one actually does the moving. And the front one's actually just long for the ride. It's just when this one moves, this one goes with it. Like that. Okay, against that against that rotor. And of course, what do we have here? We have a backing plate just like we did on the uh, on the on the uh, axle to the rear. So we're going to go ahead and take the uh, half inch socket and we're going to take this backing plate off. Hopefully it'll just drop off and then we can look and see what's behind it. This thing's only held on by those three uh, half inch bolts. They're half inch uh, bolts. Take all three off. Where's the third one at? There we go. Just take them off. And then the whole plate just falls off. It's just a piece of tin is all it is. Just a piece of old tin. There's nothing to it. No bearings, no seals, no nothing. Just a piece of tin. And that's what we have now. Pretty cool, huh? Now I'm going to try to... Uh, I'll have to get this off. I think there's a, yeah, there's a nut on the other side. This is a bolt here and here and this is a nut back there we'll get them off next and then that'll be just about it uh, and then we'll talk a little more about the budget here as soon as I get those off 
All right, a quick correction here uh, before our buddy Lockmeister jumps all over me again. <laughs> he, he didn't like the way I went over the uh, battery charger business. He, he, he went into a big explanation about how dumb I was. <laughs> so, okay, fine and dandy. Uh, I call this the uh, where the uh, shock was attached down through those holes you see between the coils there. I call that the lower control arm. Actually, it's in this case, it's the upper control arm. Uh, I guess that thing down there is what they call the lower control arm. I'd have to look in the book. It really doesn't matter what they call it. But uh, we now have our uh, rear portion of the caliper off, which is this one right here. There it is right there. Get this light out of the way. We can see a little better. And this is where that flexible hose went in. I put the bolts back in the holes. So... Uh, we will be putting, we're, we're going to dress all this up and paint it up and make it look good just like we did in the rear for those of you who followed the, the rebuild of the uh, rear of the car. It's going to look really nice. It's not going to look like this. I'm going to make it look cool. And it'll take some work and take some time. Yeah, well, that's the way it goes, you know. Primarily, though, the whole idea is safety here. I want this car safe to drive. I don't want to go out there and have an accident because I didn't do something quite right. I mean, I'm giving it my best shot. And uh, like I said, the car is not going to be driving around very much anyway just here and there a couple of times but i i don't want to hurt anybody uh you know some innocent bystander or some mom or dad or something with the kids driving down the road no i'm going to spend whatever money it takes to get this thing safe to drive all the cosmetic crap you know the inside of the car all that can come later we'll do that as time permits but the original budget for this car was set at twenty five hundred dollars if you go back and look at the video where I set the budget, I said it's $2,500 to make this car drivable, safe to drive. The rest of the car is cosmetics, and we'll do it as time permits and money permits. And then we're still on that. So I now have the entire thing stripped down almost completely. And uh, what we're going to do next time is we're going to remove this coil spring. We're going to put a spring compressor in there, and we're going to you know, compress it down. And we're not going to squeeze them so tight that the, each of the coils touch one another. That, that's not what you do. You just compress it enough to make it loose to where it, it just kind of jiggles around a little bit. Then you know you've got enough tension off. You know, when I was growing up and going through the learning car stage, I had I heard stories. Of, well, yeah, if you, if you don't compress that spring, man, there was one guy the spring flew out of the car and hit the wall and bounced back and hit him in the head and knocked him out cold. I was like, Wow. Well, guess what? That's a bunch of crap. <laughs> These springs don't have that kind of a, a, a tension in them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a spring compressor next time that, uh, that I have never seen before. I've never seen one, and I've never used it, but it is really cool. And uh, I want you to see it. So back to the budget. Uh, before this thing is over, I'm probably going to run about $500 over budget because we got to get shocks, we got to get ball joints, and we got to get new coil springs. Yeah, another 500 bucks. Yeah, after you've already spent 2,500, what's another 20? What's another 500, right? I'll just go up there and see old 64 goat. He'll he'll loan me the money. Not a problem. All right. Until next time, guys. I hope you I hope you learned something from all this. This was kind of fun being able to tear it apart and sitting on a chair. Check this out, man. I can roll around. Man, this is great, huh? <laughs> How dumb could I have gotten? This is John. Now about this battery charger I mentioned, uh, this is an old Schumacher, been around for 3,000 years, I think I bought it, about three, 4,000 years ago, and it's set up on a, uh, you can either charge 6 volt batteries or 12 volt, and it charges at a 6 amp rate or a 2 amp rate. Now in the 2 amp rate, I always refer to it as a trickle charge, but there is a difference, there's a difference between a trickle charge rate and a 2 amp rate, but I just mentioned that because I, 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 should, I probably should never even mention it, you know, but I charge it in a 2 amp rate about oh maybe once a month for an hour or so and uh, you want if you get a battery charger get one it'll shut off or you know sense the voltage on the battery and shut off automatically this one was bought way back when I don't know how long ago I bought that thing but you know this one does not shut off automatically so you have to kind of keep your eye on it depending on you know what's going on here on your charge rate and uh, when you're all done charging it you got to pay attention you just can't walk off and leave it and it'll overcharge the battery and ruin it but when you do get done and you think it's right disconnect one of your one of your clips that way it won't discharge i don't know if it would discharge through there or not probably would i don't know i never left it on to find out doesn't matter 
but uh, just keep in mind if you ever get one try to get one and it samples the battery and shuts it off when it's reached its proper charge okay okay John did I do it right I hope so <laughs> as usual there's one more one more last thing <laughs> down here on this wheel I'm gonna take this wheel in uh, tomorrow the next day have the tire removed and and uh, discarded by Walmart and then I'm gonna take this wheel in to Joe the welder and see if he can't clean this mess up down here and maybe build it up with a little weld that we can uh, grind I can grind down later on you know get the kind of shape I need I don't know if it'd be safe or not but you know the biggest problem I'm having with this thing is look at the waller out of that hole right there that thing has really been wallered out by somebody at one time or another they're all not in very good shape the problem I have here with this is they these yahoos that they're selling these wheels they want a fortune so you know the bottom line is when all is said and done do I want to buy a fortune worth of wheels, original wheels, from these guys who are selling them for too much? Or just go out and buy a set of wire wheels or something like that and put it on the car? I think these Thunderbirds look really cool with wire wheels. But this will get me by for a while until I make that decision. Oh, it's just one thing after another, huh?